Hi guys, thanks again so, so much for joining me. Now, today we're going to be starting Individual Behaviour Topic 1, Memory. And we're going to start by looking at the nature of memory. And what we're actually going to be looking at here is the absolute fundamentals, the basics of what you will need to know to have any kind of meaningful stab at studying memory as a whole. So there's going to be a lot of different terms, a lot of different phrases here that you'll need to remember moving forward. Don't worry if you don't get a chance to note them all down. There is a summary at the end. So let's get started by asking ourselves, why bother studying memory? Well, memory, I believe, is part of what makes us human. Without your memories of years gone by, each of us would be pretty much unable to function. And we'd have very little sense of who you were as a person. And again, without the ability to hold information in memory while you were working on it, I think we would be incapable of completing anything but the simplest of tasks. So it's part of what makes us human. Well, more than that, I think it is what makes us human. So it's worthy of study. We're going to look at the types of memory to start with, and we're not going to look at the types of short-term memory because that gets really complicated really quickly. Uh, but we will look at the types of long-term memory. Broadly speaking, we can split it into two halves. We'll look at the declarative memories. First, declarative memory is, simply speaking, when you declare something. So you declare facts. It's stuff that you know. We can further subdivide that into two areas to understand what we mean by this. The first type is semantic memory. The semantic memory is, simply speaking, knowing what. It's a fact that you know. So, for example, if I was to ask you what you had for your tea last night, you'd tell me whatever, sausages or chicken and chips or whatever it would be. If I asked you what the capital of Turkmenistan was, you'd tell me quite clearly that it was Ashgabat, right? Well, I'll always say I've just looked that up, but I probably won't forget that now. So I've added that to our semantic memory. The other type of declarative memory is something called an episodic memory. And an episodic memory is like it sounds. It's an episode. It's knowing when, a time in your life that you can recall. So it might be a particular day that was really good that you had last summer or on holiday. It might be your first memory. For example, I remember throwing up into a fireman's hat after getting stuck on a ride at Flamingoland. That is a particular episode in my past. Uh, you Feel free to laugh at it. Um, but that is an episodic memory. The other half of long-term memory is not so much about knowing facts, but it's more about knowing how to do stuff. We call these procedural memories. It's less about facts, it's more learning how to ride a bike, learning how to use a knife and fork, learning how to properly cross a road. You don't really think about these stuff, you just kind of do them. And that is because you have procedural memories that help you to do them. In terms of the way the memory is organised, we can put it into two different stores. Now we have to be clear here because these are often used in the wrong way by laymen. So we, as a psychologists, we use them in the correct way. Interestingly enough, Dory here from Finding Nemo, she gets it spot on. She has an absolutely appalling short-term memory. Short-term memory, like it sounds, it doesn't last very long. It's a temporary store. If I gave you, let's say, a phone number to dial, you would hold that information in your head long enough for you to press the buttons on the phone, and then you'd probably never ever remember again what I told you in the first place. It's gone from your short-term memory. The opposite to that is, quite obviously, your long-term memory, and that looks a little bit more like this, or at least this is the way we imagine it. Long-term memory is much more long-lasting, and it's about storing away those memories for future use. It has a long lasting ability. You can retrieve them from multiple parts of your mind. It's the long term memory. Now, when we're studying both short term memory and long term memory, we can do that in terms of three different areas. The first thing we can ask is how does that type of memory encode? Does it encode the sound of the word? For example, I'm sitting at my desk. So do I remember the sound of the word desk, do I remember that? Or do I remember more the object, the actual vision 
of the desk itself. It's kind of big, it's made of oak, it, it's a very nice desk if I do say so myself. Do I recall a, a, a perfect image of a desk in my mind? Or do I remember the semantics behind it? Do I remember more what a desk is for? So the computer sitting on it, my keyboard, my books, my printer, all these kind of things. Do I remember the meaning of a desk? The second thing we can ask is how are those memories, or sorry, how are those memory processes, uh, how long do they last for in terms of duration? So is it a couple of seconds? Is it a few minutes? Or is it even multiple different years stretching far into the future? That's duration. And finally, we can ask ourselves, how big is that memory? How much stuff can it actually hold? That is capacity. So it might be one or two little bits of information. It might be 10 or 11 bits of information. It might be literally billions of bits of information. That's capacity. The three different things here, encoding duration capacity, differ across short-term and long-term memory. And that's what we're going to explore now. In the short-term memory, we can uh, reliably say that information is encoded acoustically. Your short-term memory, memory remembers the sound of words. Conrad in 1964 shows that, that if you are given a list of acoustically dissimilar letters, you remember them a little bit better. If you're given words, sorry, letters that are uh, acoustically similar, things like B, C, um, what about E, these are all acoustically similar, you kind of mess them up, you can't really remember them. Bradley does something similar, but we'll look at his study in a little bit. In terms of duration, how long does the short-term memory last for? Well, Peterson and Peterson would say roughly 18 seconds, but it might be even less than that if you don't have a chance to rehearse that memory inside your short-term memory. And in terms of capacity, Miller does a really nice study again in the 1950s, which says that there are enough, there's enough space in the short-term memory for seven bits of information. Some people a little bit less, some people a little bit more. So seven items is good, plus or minus two. However, you can improve that a little bit by chunking to make it even more. So, for example, if I ask you to remember the letters B, B, C, well, that's going to take up three of your spaces. But if I give you it in the phrase the BBC, that only takes up one spot. I've chunked that information together, made it a little bit smaller and made it a little bit easier to remember. The long-term memory couldn't be more different. Badly in the 1960s tells us that encoding isn't so much acoustic. This time it's the meaning of the object, the meaning of the word that you remember. It's semantic encoding. Again, we'll look at that study in a second. In terms of duration, multiple different studies into this. A really good one in the 1970s by Barrick tells us that it's, well, pretty long, to be honest, at least 47 years. At least that's according to his study, very interesting study he does with people and their yearbooks. And finally, in terms of capacity, well, come to think about how on earth do we measure that? It's pretty huge. Is there a way to measure that? Well, there are one or two, but psychologists don't bother because it's really hard. So we just put a question mark next to it. It's probably limitless, but we don't know for sure. Very difficult to test, however, so we're comfortable with that just now. One key study to remember in this area, guys, is Badly 1966. Here he's basically shooting two birds uh, with one stone and he's telling us both short-term memory and long-term memory encoding at the same time. His thoughts behind the study go as follows. He recognises that people sometimes muddle up names, names of places or of people on the phone, even if they've just been told them. However, if you're asked to recall very, very similar sounding names from your long-term memory, well, you know exactly what they are. So, for example, you'd be very unlikely to mess up hair, this rabbit looking thing here, and hair, the fluffy stuff that comes out the top of your head. Very unlikely that you would get those two things mixed up. So Badley's thinking, why should that be? What's the difference between short term memory and long term memory? How are they encoding the information? So what he does is he gets lots of participants together in a room. He gives them lists of words which are either acoustically similar. So words like chair, hair bear. Or he gives them a list of words which are semantically similar. Things like uh, rabbit, hare, bunny. Or a third group he gives a list of basically random words. It doesn't matter what they are. 
And crucially, he asks them to recall their list either immediately, so he's testing their short-term memory, or after 20 minutes, so he's testing their long-term memory. And what does he find? Well, if you're given the acoustically similar list and you're asked to recall immediately, you get it wrong. You mess everything up inside your head. You've got so many different sounds inside your head, or rather you've got the same sound again and again inside your head, that you mess it up. You could say, yeah, chair was there, bear, was lair there? What about there? Was that? I can't remember. Was there there? I don't know. That means that short-term memory is acoustically encoded. You remember it better if it's dissimilar. If you're asked to recall the semantically similar list after 20 minutes, then again, you get a lot of it wrong. So you might remember, yeah, I remember bunny and rabbits. Um, uh, oh, was hair there? Oh, I can't remember. It might have been. It could have been. So again, you're confusing it because there's so many of the same meaning floating around inside your head. So what Badley concludes is that the long-term memory encodes semantically. Always nice to do a bit of evaluation here. So first things first, this is a lab experiment. Pretty good, right? Scientific, well-controlled, but ultimately pretty artificial. And again, is there any relevance to the real world here? It would be very rare, other than maybe a shopping list, of you being asked to recall lists of acoustically similar items. So unless someone's asking you, okay, uh, we Jimmy, go off to the shop, and what I want today is I want some, um, I don't know, I want some hair, um, I want uh, I want some bears, um, I want some uh, I want some stuff that I can tear. You know that would never really happen. So it probably doesn't have any relevance to the real world. Key concepts you'll need to know, guys, are these all the way from short term memory, long term memory, all the way through to the types of encoding that we've looked at there. If you can reliably remember what these all these different terms mean here, then you'll be doing pretty well and you can pretty much have a good stab at any memory essay that you're given. Thanks a lot, guys. Next uh, video, we're going to be looking at the biological approach into memory. So a little bit more specific now, looking at what the biologists have got to tell us about how we store memories inside our brains. Until then, guys, have a lovely, lovely day and we'll see you again later. Cheers.